So uh, I've been thinking a little bit uh, about stories and th this one in particular, but uh, also about about uh, this weekend and uh, uh, and where stories come from and a little bit about what I think I don't know for sure, but what I think Joel's going to talk about, which is uh, which is the idea of, of recognizing patterns. And I've been thinking about poetry and story in terms of recognizing patterns. And in our society, we tend to say or believe or have been taught that the stories come out of the human imagination. And uh, I would say that's that's only a, a small partly true. You know, the human imagination uh, is not something that is isolated. The human imagination is in relationship to the world around it. And that's, and, and it recognizes one of the things human beings as an animal are, are good at is recognizing patterns or imagining patterns and putting ourselves in the place of other beings, other people, other animals, trees, rocks. Our imagination can put us in those places. Um, stories and poems are, are uh, patterns, they're, they're tracks that our imagination has, has created, not created, but recognized and articulated based on the world around us. So in a very real sense, this, the poems and stories uh, come not out of our imagination, but they're simply recognized and articulated by our imagination because they come out of the world and they come out of a specific place in the world. And this story comes from a particular place in the world. It comes from a place uh, called the Amur River. And the Amur River is a river that unlike most of the rivers in Siberia where it is located, most of the rivers in Siberia run north, run from the south to the north into the Arctic Ocean, but the Amur River runs from the west to the east, and it makes up part of the border, the boundary between what is now called Siberia and what is called China. On the Siberian side, it's the Amur. On the Chinese side, the Chinese name for it is the Black Dragon River. And it happened one time that the Nivka were living on the banks of the Amur River. The Nivka are a Siberian people. And the name Nivka means the people. Or we might say the human beings. So we might say that the human beings one time made their camp and their home on the banks of the Amur River. Now it was the case that when the river teemed with fish and the people were well fed, that the camp of the human beings of the Nivka was filled with song, and the men were giving each other crap and joking in the way they do, and the women were laughing at them and making fun of them, and there was a lot of chaff chatter, and there was a lot of laughter, and there was a lot of music, and there was dance, and that's the way it was when times were good. But there were other times when the river was not as generous when food was scarce. And at those times, the Nivka, the human beings, they sat on the banks of the river and they smoked pipes filled with moss to dull the ache in their bellies. And it was on a night like that, a day like that, they were sitting on the shore of the river, maybe near dusk, smoking their pipes when they saw something they had never seen before. And what it was, was they saw an island floating in the river, moving with the current slowly toward them. Now, the old people just sat there and watched, and the younger ones jumped to their feet and craned their necks a bit to get a better view. But after a time, that island came a little nearer and they saw that it wasn't in fact an island. What it was, 
was a big snag of trees. Some very large trees had washed into the river from upstream somewhere, and they'd become entangled with each other. And at some point, they probably caught on the shore, and silt and mud had washed over them. And then grass had started to grow on the silt and mud. So it looked for all the world like an island, but it was a big snag of trees with grass growing over it. And this was floating down the river toward them. And when it got us a little closer still, they heard something. It was the cry of an infant, of a baby. And one of the oldest of the human beings, of the Nivka, his name was Platun. He was old, but he was still very sharp-eyed, and he noticed that on that floating island, someone had erected a pole a staff, and on the top of that there was a red piece of cloth. And Platun said, that was set there as a talisman of protection against evil spirits to protect the baby that is on that island crying. And it is only a mother who is very desperate who would cast her baby adrift on the waters in that way. It could be that their people were overrun by enemies and being slaughtered. Or it might be that a great epidemic had swept through their village. And so this mother cast her child onto that floating island. And when the island drew, drew nearer still, some of the men of the human beings took ropes with hooks on them, grappling hooks, that they would use to haul up fish traps and to and to pull boats together, they swung those hooks out and they caught on that island and then all the people pulled on the rope and they drew that floating island to the shore where they were standing. And when they climbed aboard that floating island, they found there a little baby boy with a broad moon face and dark brown eyes. In one hand, he held an arrow and in the other hand, he held an oar. And old Platoon, the human being who had remembered the most winters, said, It is a good sign, it is a good omen, for it means that that boy will be afraid neither of battle nor of hard work. And old Platoon said, I will adopt this boy as my son, and I give him the name Asmun. For Osmon means gift, and it is my hope that he shall be a gift to the people as he is a gift to us from the river. And old Platun had someone pick up the baby, and he told him to bring the baby to his lodge, his yurta. And as the people clambered off the island and carried the baby up the bank, they called out to Platun, they said, Hey, Platun! This baby of yours is getting heavier by the minute. He's growing like crazy. It's a good sign, said Platon, and he walked on. But before they even got halfway to Platon's yurta from the bank of the river, and it wasn't far, before they even got halfway, they had to put that child down because he was already too heavy to carry, and they let him walk himself, and by the time they reached the door of Platon's yurta, he was a full-grown, strong young man. And when they reached that door, Osmun, the young man, stepped aside, and he let everyone else go in, for they were all his elders. And Platon nodded to himself and thought, it's a good sign. The young man respects his elders, and he thinks of others before himself. And when they were all settled in the lodge, Osman came and sat down at the feet of his father. Platon was sitting on his little sleeping platform that he had in his yurta. And Osman looked around and said, You look hungry and tired, father. Let me go out and catch some fish for us. And so he went out and he cast a little boat out onto the Amur River and he took his oar and he set his oar beating the water. He beat the water with it so hard that the shockwaves stunned the fish and they floated up to the top 
and then he took his net and scooped them up and carried them back and divided them amongst the people. And later, when he and Platon were eating their fish, he said, Father, the fishing here is not so good. The fish are not as plentiful as they should be, and the ones that I've caught are smaller than they should be. What you say is true, my son, said Platon. The fishing here has not been so good as I remember when I was young. It has not been good for many years. He, Platon said, in the old days, we would go out on the river and we would make offerings. We would cast dried fish and meat and tobacco out onto the waters and we would sing the old songs and we would make the old prayers and we would ask the river not to forget the Nivka, not to forget the human beings. But it might be that I'm the only one that remembers the old songs and the old ways. And Osman said, well, Father, let us try that again. And so the next day they gathered the people and they pushed their boats out into the water and they went out into the middle of the river and Platon stood up and he cast dried fish and meat under the waters and threw some tobacco and he made the old songs and he said the prayers and he asked the river to remember the human beings, the Nivka, and to be generous once again. And when he had finished it, then Osman cast his net on the waters and he pulled up a great load of fish. And he cast his net a second time, but this time he pulled up fewer fish. And he cast his net a third time and he pulled up hardly any fish at all. And after that time, whenever anyone cast their nets on the waters of the Amr, they didn't catch a single fish, not even a smelt. And so they took the catch back to shore. And Osman said to the people, Now, preserve the fish in the way that you do and put them in a storehouse, for it will be all you have for a good long time. <coughs> and that night, <clears throat> Platon sat in his lodge with Osman. And Osman sat there smoking his father's pipe with moss in it, smoking and thinking. He thought and smoked for a long time. He produced so much smoke it would fill three barns. And after this smoking, Pletin leaned forward and he said, my son, I must apologize. I thought I was saving you, bringing you here to live with the human beings. But you should leave this place. You should go away from us. For I see now that the human beings, the Nivka, have no future. The human beings are doomed. You should get away and find some other place. And Osman thought for a time. And then he said, Father, it seems to me that what must be done is that someone must go visit Ternads, Ternads, the old man of the sea, and ask him for mercy, and ask him to remember the human beings. Well, said Platon, no one has been to visit Ternads in many generations. No one knows where he lives. And even if we did know where he lived and how to get there, do you even have the strength for such a journey? And Osman stood up and he stamped his foot. And that stamp so indented the ground that he was in a hole up to his neck. And he jumped out of the hole and he picked up a stone, a small boulder, and he began to squeeze it. 
and he squeezed water out of the boulder, and then the boulder collapsed into a fine powder. And then Osman took his bow and strung it, and he knocked an arrow, and he pointed far off, and he said, Father, do you see that mountain in the distance, that blue mountain in the distance? At the foot of that mountain, there is a squirrel, and in that squirrel's mouth, there is a nut that he is unable to crack. And then he drew the bow, and he shot, and his arrow traveled far until it hit that nut and cut it right in half without hurting the little animal. And the next day, the next day, Osman gathered some things to take with him. He took his knife, and he took also a length of rope with one of the grappling hooks on it, which he wound around his shoulders. And he took also some pretty beads that the human beings, the Nivka, made, and he put those in his pouch, his satchel. And he also took a mouth harp, thinking he might like to have some music in his travels. And he put that in his satchel as well. And he took one more thing. He went down to the banks of the Amor River, and he filled a little pouch with earth from his homeland. And this he put in his satchel as well. And then he bid his farewells and started on his way. He walked downstream along the banks of the Amur. He walked for a long way until the Amur came to the sea. The Amur empties into the sea at a place the Nivka call the Little Sea. It's what we call today the Sea of Japan, up near the tip of Sakhalin Island. And there, where the river meets the sea, he met a small seal. And he greeted the seal. He said, Hello, brother. Tell me, I'm on my way to see Ternads, the old man of the sea. Do you know where he lives, where I might find him? And the seal just shook his head and said, In the sea, I suppose. But beyond that, he could offer him no further assistance. And so Osman walked on further. He walked on to what the, the Nivka call the Great Sea, what we call the Sea of Oktoshk. And there he saw some seagulls and cormorants flying about. And these two he greeted, Hello, brothers. How's fishing? Terrible, said one of the seagulls. We're so weak from hunger that we can barely flap our wings. Well, said Osman, as it happens, I'm on my way to visit with Ternads, the old man of the sea himself, to ask for his pity. Can you tell me where he lives? And the seagull said, we don't know. We don't fly that far. But we've heard some stories from our relatives, the migrating birds and the far-flying albatross, we've heard stories that Ternads lives on an island somewhere in the sea, a mountain of an island sticking up out of the sea, and from the top of that mountain on that island, smoke comes out of that island. And in fact, it isn't really an island. It's his yurta. It's the roof of his yurta. It is his home. But beyond that, and where in the great world ocean it might be, we have no idea. And so, Osman continued on his way, walking along the coast. At last he came to a wide beach with dunes, and he sat down to consider his situation. And he realized that the situation was that he needed to go talk to the old man of the sea, but he had no idea where in the great world oceans he might be, that he was on some island somewhere in some sea somewhere in the world, but he had no idea of how to get there. And not only that, he didn't have a boat. 
and it might be that at that moment the utter hopelessness of his task landed upon his heart. And it might be that he added some salt to the ocean with his tears at that point. After a time, Osmond fell asleep and he had a dream. He dreamed that he was on the very beach that he was on and some young men showed up on the beach. And they were talking and laughing and running around up and down the beach the way young men do. And each of those young men carried with them a saber. And at some point, somewhere down the beach, a shoal of seals pulled up onto the beach. And those young men drew their sabers and they fell upon the seals, killing many of them. And then they began the process of butchering the seals and of stacking the meat. And while they were doing this, one of the young men put his saber down so that he might work with the seals and help with the butchering. And Osman, who was concealed behind a dune, thought to himself, I'd like to have a nice saber like that. And so he took his grappling hook and line off of him and he swung it and he hooked the hilt of that saber and he pulled it carefully towards him. Now after a time when the butchering was done that young man came back looking for his saber and he was sure he had left it right there but it wasn't there and he looked further up and down the beach and after a bit the young men began to get ready to leave but that young man without a saber called out to his friends and he said hey brothers I I can't find my saber and, and how what will I say to the master how can I present myself to Ternads without my saber and Osmond heard this and he said these young men know where Ternads is they will lead me there and the young man helped him look for a bit, but you know how it is with your, with your friends. If you screw up, if you lose something, they'll help for a while, but then it's like, eh, we're going. So the young man went down to the waters, except for the one without his saber. He went off into the woods to look for it further. And they drew their sabers and they touched the blade of their saber to the ocean. And instantly each saber was transformed into a boat and each of the men jumped into his boat and started paddling out to sea. And seeing his chance, Osmond too waited till the coast was clear, and then he ran down with the saber, and he drew the saber, and he touched the blade of it to the water, and it too was transformed into a boat, and he began to paddle after the young men, paddling as hard as he could paddle. But the young men had a head start, and they were good paddlers. And after a time, he went far out away from the sight of land, still paddling, but he wasn't gaining ground. He was losing ground on those young men in their boats. And after a while, he lost sight of them altogether, but he kept paddling. He kept paddling, and then night fell on the ocean as he was paddling without any idea really of what direction he was going in or where the currents or winds were taking him or where he was going. He just continued to paddle. There was no moon that night. The clouds were out. There were no stars. It was utter darkness out on the ocean. And that's where we will leave him for tonight. All right, so you remember that the human beings, the Nivka, were living by the Amur River. Do you remember that? And do you remember that they saw something strange while they were smoking their pipes? They saw a floating island approaching them. It was a snag of trees, and on that snag of trees, that floating island, there was a flagpole with a little red banner on it, a talisman of protection for a baby that had been cast adrift on that island. Do you remember that? You remember they pulled the island over and they looked at the baby and the old man, Platun, 
decided to adopt that baby to live among the human beings, among the Nivka. And he named him Asmun, which means gift. And they brought the baby up to Platoon's yurt. But as they did so, the baby grew prodigiously. And by the time they got to the door of the yurt, he was a full grown, strong young man. And do you remember that they went out and caught some fish, but Osman saw that the fishing wasn't very good. And so Platoon went out with the people and they made offerings to the river and then they tried the fishing again, but they found eventually that the river was completely fished out. And Platoon apologized to Osman for bringing him among the human beings because he knew that the human beings were doomed. Do you remember that? And you remember that Osman decided to go find Ternads, the old man of the sea himself, to ask for his mercy. And he demonstrated his strength and he gathered some things to take with him and then he set off on his trip. He went down the river, down the Amur, to where it met the sea. And he met a seal and he met some seagulls and seabirds and he asked them if they knew where Ternads was but they couldn't give him much information except that somewhere in the sea, there was an island with smoke coming out of the top of a mountain and that was the yurta of Ternads. And he went further and sat down on a beach and began to realize the hopelessness of the situation. And it could be that he wept on that beach, but whatever happened at some point, he fell asleep and he dreamed that some young men came onto the beach, the young men with sabers. And while the young men with sabers were running up and down the beach, some seals came ashore and the young men fell on the seals and they slaughtered many of them. And while they were butchering the seals, one of the young men set down his saber and Osman took his gaff hook and he swung it out and caught the hilt of that saber and he drew it to him and kept it with them to remember that. And you remember that the young men turned and took their sabers and they touched the blade, the edge of their sabers to the sea and the sabers turned into water, all except the young man who saber had been stolen by Osman. He went off to look for it and Osman followed suit. He went down to the shoreline. He touched the saber to the water and it too became a boat. Do you remember that? And do you remember and he paddled after those young men because he had heard them talking about Ternads, about the master, and he knew they were headed that way. And he paddled out after them, far out of the sight of land. He paddled and paddled, but eventually he lost sight of them and night fell. And that's where we had left him. Do you remember that? Well, <clears throat> all through that moonless, starless night, he paddled not knowing what direction he was paddling in, just following the bow of his boat to wherever it led. He kept paddling and eventually, as it does, the sun came up and he continued to paddle. He saw nothing around him but water and sky and he continued to paddle. And at some point, he found himself among a pod of whales, orca whales, their tall back fins, their dorsal fins cutting through the water like curved sabers as they came up. The whales at least were some company for him. So he continued to paddle with that pod of whales. And after some time, one of the whales came up near the surface, right near his boat, and he noticed something unusual. He noticed that skewered on the fin of that whale, curved like a saber as it cut through the water, were pieces of seal meat. And he knew at that moment that those whales, those orcas, were the young men on the beach, and that they were leading him to Ternads that he was with them and he knew the way now again to follow the pod of whales, of orcas. And so he paddled with an encouraged heart, a more cheerful heart. At least he knew 
who he was following. And as he was paddling, he felt something rise up underneath his boat and lift him out of the water. It was another orca, but that orca didn't have a dorsal fin. For that one was the young man whose sword, whose saber he had taken. That young whale lifted him out of the water and began carrying him at great speed along with the pod. And Osman thought, even better. I'll get to Ternad's island even sooner this way. And even though they were traveling at great speed, the speed of orca whales across the water, still the journey took so long that by the time they neared that island, by the time that island with the smoke coming out of the top of it came into view, he had a long beard. And as they got near the island, the orca men leapt out of the water and transformed back into their human shape, their boats again, sabers. But the whale that he was riding felt shame for not having his saber for not having his dorsal fin. And at the last minute, he turned away and dove and it flipped the boat over and Osman went into the water. The boat was transformed into a saber which he clutched onto. And the young men on the beach, the orca men, saw him flailing about near the shore and they ran in and pulled him onto the island. They stood looking at him amazed and they said, who are you stranger and how did you get here? And he said, brothers, don't you recognize me? I, I was back with you at the beach. Uh, I lost my saber and I went to look for it. It took me a while and I thought maybe I wouldn't find it, but here it is. And they looked at the saber and said, well, that's truly your saber. But why is it that you don't look anything like yourself? And Osman said, oh, don't I? Well, it, you know, it, it must be the stress of having lost my saber and being worried. I, I'd better go see Ternads. Perhaps he can restore me to my normal appearance. And the young men pointed up at the smoke coming out of the mountain. And they said, you can see the smoke from Ternads yurt. It means he's sleeping and he can't be wakened. And with that, they divided up the seal meat and they went home to their lodges. And Osman continued inland, starting his way up the hill to the top of Ternad's Yurta, to the top of the mountain. But when he had gotten part way up, he saw some women standing on the path and they blocked his way. And they said, where are you going, handsome stranger? And he said, well, I'm on my way to see Ternad's the master, the old man of the sea. And the women pointed at the smoke and they said, can't you see there's smoke coming out of his smoke hole? He's sleeping and can't be wakened. But you know, you could stay here with us. You could marry one of us. And the girls were extraordinarily beautiful. Each one he looked at, it seemed, was more beautiful than the last, with big, soft eyes and long, beautiful tresses of hair and skillful hands which now reached over his body and began to caress him. And Osman thought to himself, I could be very happy being married to one of these beautiful women. But just to that moment, he felt something vibrating vibrating in his pouch on his hip. It was the little bag of earth that he'd taken from the bank of the river. And he remembered what he was there to do. And while the women were becoming more and more friendly, he reached into his pouch and he pulled out the beautiful little colored beads. And these he scattered on the ground and the women began to scramble for them. And as they bent over to collect the beads, their skirts lifted a bit and he saw that instead of legs and feet, the women had flippers. And that in fact, they weren't women at all, but seals. 
And while the seal women were distracted collecting the pretty beads, Osman continued on his way, making his way inland and up the hill. He climbed all the way to the top to where the smoke hole was. And then he took his rope and his grappling hook off. And he tied the hook and the rope around a snag that was there. And he threw the rope down the smoke hole. And then he began to lower himself down into Ternad's yurta. And when he got down to the floor of the yurta, he looked around. And even though it was immense, he couldn't help that no, but notice that it was basically the same as the yurtas at home. It had a fire pit in the middle, and it was round, and there was a sleeping platform at one side with ternads there sleeping soundly on it. One other thing was different about it. The walls were all covered in fish scales and in mother of pearl shells, and they glistened like rainbows in the light. And when he looked out the window, instead of seeing trees and grasses, he saw seaweeds and fish and sea creatures swimming by, and he realized that the yurta sat on the bottom of the ocean. And then he looked over at Ternads himself sleeping on the sleeping platform on the wooden bench. Ternads was enormous, and his skin too was made of the beautiful rainbow colored scales and the mother of pearl shells. And his whiskers, his beard flowed out from his face like the whiskers of a catfish or the whiskers of a sturgeon. He slept soundly, snoring there. And he noticed too that the smoke that was going out the smoke hole came not from the central fire pit, it came from a pipe that was smoldering by the bedside of Ternads. After a time, Osman thought he would make a sound. He cleared his throat loudly. <clears throat> but this had no effect whatsoever. And after a little while longer, he spoke aloud. He called Ternad's name. But this too had no effect. He spoke a little louder, but still Ternad slept on. Finally, he went up and began to touch Ternads. But Ternads continued to sleep. At last, he pushed on Ternads as hard as he could, trying to shake him, but Ternads was so huge that trying to wake Ternads in this way was akin to you or I going into the sea on a calm day and trying to stir up a hurricane with our hands and our breath. It was utterly impossible. And he began to realize that when the people said Ternads could not be wakened, they didn't mean that it wasn't permitted. They meant that it wasn't possible. And Osman thought for a moment about the situation. And then he remembered the other thing that he'd brought with him, the jaw harp, the little musical instrument. He pulled it out of his pouch and he began to play. He began to make that jaw harp hum and twang. He made it buzz like a hive of a million bees. He made it chirp like the sound of a gopher. He made it roar like a waterfall. And as he began to sing and hum and play the jaw harp, Ternads roused himself. He sat up to look to see where this strange sound was coming from. And he saw there a small, almost infinitesimal human being standing in his yurta. Ternads raised himself up to his full height he towered over Osman like a mountain over a pebble, like a great wave over a man in the sea.
Osman stopped playing and Ternad said, who are you little fellow and how did you get here? And Osman said, I am Osman. I am of the Nivka. The Nivka, said Ternads. Why the Nivka, the human beings, they live way up on the Amur River. Yes, said Osman. And he began to explain the problems, the trouble the human beings were in, how the fish had dried up, how the river no longer provided. And Taranad hung his head and said, yes, that really is a pity. You know, it's my fault. I, I dozed off for just a moment and I forgot all about the human beings. And with that, he reached under his bed and he pulled out an urn and he took off the cover and then he reached under his bed again and he pulled out a blanket of whale skins and he spread out that blanket and he reached into the urn and the urn was filled with fish and sea life of every description. And he filled that great whale skin blanket about one quarter full of fish and sea life. And then he folded it up and he took it to the door of his yurt and he threw the fish and sea life out into the sea. And he said, go now, go now fish, swim, swim all the way up to the Amor River. So that the Nivka, so that the human beings will have fish this spring. And Osman thought about his old father, Pletuan. And it occurred to him that old Pletuan might not make it to the spring. And so he spoke again and he said, Lord Ternads, might it be possible for you to provide some more fish for the human beings, for the Nivka? And anger flashed in Ternad's eyes at the presumption of this. And he turned and looked at Osman. But then he softened, for he saw that Osman was thinking not of himself, but of others, of his old father. And it melted Ternad's heart. And he said, ordinarily, I would not be very pleased with such a request, but in this case, I will grant it. And he reached into the great urn again and he pulled out more fish. And again, he filled the blanket, this time about halfway full. And he folded it up and he took it to the sea, to the door, and he flung the fish out the door. And he said, go now, go to the Amo River so that the human beings have fish in spring and summer and fall and winter. And then Osman reached into his satchel and he said, Lord Ternads, you are most kind and most merciful. I'm but a poor human being. I haven't much to offer, but I give you this. And he gave him the jaw harp and he showed him how to use it and how to make different sounds on it, how to make it chirp like a gopher and roar like a waterfall and hum like bees and how to sing the songs. And Ternads began to play. And as he began to play, he began to sing and hum and dance and dance around his yurta. And as he stomped and danced and buzzed and roared on the jaw harp, a great storm began to form at sea. A mighty storm and the waves began to roll. The seas began to crash. The winds began to howl. And Osman thought it might be a good time to take his leave. And so he began to climb up the rope again. But in the time he was down there, Barnacles and mollusks and shellfish had made their home on that rope so that by the time he got up to the top, his hands were cut and bloody. And he pulled himself out the smoke hole 
onto the top of the yurt and pulled his rope up behind him. And he began to look around. And he saw that the young men, the orca boys, had jumped into the sea and transformed themselves back into whales. They were driving those fish back to the Amur River, to the people, to the human beings. And he looked down and he saw that the seal women were down below. They were still divvying out the beads that he had thrown to them. And it occurred to him that he had no clue, no idea of how he might get back home. But at that moment, the sky brightened and a rainbow formed. One end of it reached Ternad's island and it arched far over the sea all the way to the mainland. And so Osman began to climb the rainbow. He pulled himself up and though it was very slippery, he managed to pull and climb up and up, higher and higher. And as he pulled himself, dragging his body along the rainbow, the colors of the rainbow began to stain his body in different places. His legs were yellow, his trunk was red, his head was blue, his arms were violet as he pulled himself up along the rainbow to the very peak of it. And then he began to slide down the whole way all the way back across the sea to the mainland. And as he came down, he saw that the rainbow, the rainbow ended at the very beach where he had taken to the sea, where he had met the young whalemen. And there, sitting on the beach, was the young whale boy whose saber he had stolen. And when he landed, he went over to the whale man and he presented him with the saber. And the young whale man said, Oh, thank you. I thought I had lost it. I would never be able to go home and show myself to Ternads. Thank you so much. And he transformed himself back into a whale. The saber became his fin and he drove more fish up the Amur River for the human beings. And then Osman went on his way back the way he had come. And after a time, he came to the gulls and the cormorants and the seabirds. And he said, greetings, brother. And the seagull said, well, did you find Ternads? And Osman said, just look in the sea. And the seagulls looked and they saw that the sea was now teeming with fish and they began to feed voraciously and fatten up before his very eyes. And he went on further till he came to the little sea where he had met that seal, that small skinny seal who by now was very weak. And the seal looked at him and said, did you find Ternad's island? And he said, don't ask me, look for yourself in the sea. And the seal looked out and saw all the fish teeming in the sea and began to feed and fatten up before his very eyes. And Osman continued, he walked on until he came to the mouth of, of the Amur and he went up the stream to his own village, to where the people were, to where the human beings, the Nivka were. And there, walking feebly out to greet him was old Pletun. Pletun was very weak from hunger and very thin, and he wrapped his arms around his son, and he stuck his nose in his son's neck and took in the smell of his returned son. And he said, well, my son, did you find Lord Ternats? And Osmond said, don't ask me, father, just look in the river. And the river was alive with fish. And the human beings, the Nivka, cast out their boats and cast out their nets and made their offerings of thanks to the river. And once again, the human beings feasted. And once again, the songs were told. And once again, laughter and teasing rang out through the camp. And ever after that time, whenever 
the sea stormed and the winds howled and the waves broke on the shore, the human beings would say, ah, ah, that's old man of the sea, that's Ternads playing his mouth harp and dancing in his yurta. That's the way it was. You know, the whole story was overheard as it was told by the banks of the Amor by a loon who was living there in the river. And that story was carried by the loon people for many generations of loons, which is what gives the story its great depth and its mournful qualities. But one year it happened that an otter came across a loon's nest and took one of the eggs and swam out with the egg on his chest the way they do. And he tried to crack that egg, but it slipped out of his little paws and fell into the river and broke on a stone. And young salmon fed on that egg yolk and the story went into the salmon people. And they carried it for many generations of salmon. They carried it from fresh water to salt and back to fresh, which is why the story takes place in those two realms of fresh water and salt water. But one year, after many generations of the salmon carrying it, an old sturgeon ate a young salmon there in the Amur River. And the story went into the sturgeon people, which gives the story its ancient wisdom. And it so happened that someday, one day, some time ago, I was at a party a rather fancy soiree, and the people were serving sturgeon caviar. And it happened that one egg out of the thousands of eggs in that tin of caviar, one of those eggs carried the story. And I happened to eat the cracker with that egg in it, and the story went into me, and now I've told you. <laughs>